Welcome to Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. Legal issues simplified through real client stories and real world experiences. Creating simplicity in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. I'm your host, Berta Dotto, with my co host, Michael Bird. Thanks, Brad. As a business and healthcare law firm, we represent clients in multiple sectors and multiple specialties, especially healthcare. Yep. This season, our theme is Specialty Spotlight, where each episode we will visit about some of the nuances that can be found from a business and healthcare perspective in the various practice specialties. Michael, I'm going to make a demand. I would like a raise for co hosting this podcast with you. Perfect. I'll double your salary. Riley? You heard him. We have a guest here. I have two witnesses. Yeah, I mean, in fact, Riley, you can just have uh, Brad pick any multiple he wants of his current salary. Is. Make it done. So uh, he gets paid nothing. Oh, shoot. Well, apparently I need a better agent. Um, as I read an article released on how podcast guests are paying up to $50,000 just to appear on these popular podcast shows. I know. I read it, too. The critics are calling this process payola and think listeners uh, in the article they think the, the critics think these listeners should know about the promotional ties of guests and quotes that are you know kind of paying to jump on podcasts yeah and it was shocking to me for two reasons first apparently it's extremely widespread um, for many different shows and second uh, we've been undercharging our guests for joining us yeah well if by undercharging you mean we aren't charging them then yes we're undercharging them um, that's, I think, why they call them guests. That's a fair point, Michael. But um, what also was surprising me is when I, I was speaking, Riley and I were actually speaking about this off air beforehand, and she was shocked to see the like the laundry list of these extremely well-known podcasters, which do actually require these payments. These are not some mom and pop ones. These are actually really well-known podcasters. Yeah, I mean, and when you read the article, you know, the, the guests pay the money. They know that and, and they can push their product or their course or whatever it is that is kind of their underlying thing and they can get a two to three X return for appearing on these popular shows. So uh, the money quickly makes sense for them to, to pay it. Of course, I understand the critics point of view that it should be clear who is a guest and who's actually, you know, kind of the going back to the TV paid shows you see on Saturday morning yes. or as the line across the bottom that you're uh, that this is a paid promotional content. Um, but I am curious, like how we have a guest in here. It's kind of feeling sure. a little awkward yeah, right now. Kind of awkward How's right now. all this pain to play connect to our well, guest today? Well, fair question. Today's guest, he's a friend, former colleague. And I thought, what better way to start a new pay to play program by inviting him on and then invoicing him afterwards. So Michael, let's bring him on so we can start charging. Oh, I think that's a wonderful idea. Our guest is our friend first and uh, someone we've known for many years, Justin Puckett. Justin went to Texas A&M with a BBA and an MS in accounting. He went to University of Houston Law School. He uh, practiced law before leaving to co work at a dental support organization, or DSO, as they say on the streets. He is now president of MB2 Dental, where he's been since 2013. He has a unique blend of experiences in corporate finance, public accounting, and corporate law. And most importantly, Brad, mm -hmm. he was a law clerk and an associate of you and me before you ran him off. I mean, before he left the practice of law. He saw the light at the end of the tunnel and left. But uh, Justin, thank you for joining us. No, happy to be here. Yeah, so we're going to put you a spot right away. How much money do you have in your wallet? Because as you can see, audience members you're watching on our YouTube channel, we have this great new payola jar here. and. Um, all our new our guests will put money in it. Um, Riley, our enforcer over here, she's not going to let you leave until you put money, all your money, including pocket change in there. Yep, bad news is not not a big cash guy, I think, oh. uh, you know. But uh, you, you know, Venmo, you can you know, okay. like everything. Go, Riley, go through my wife. Yes, go Venmo, invoice, invoice her, and she'll yeah. take care of that one. So that's the, the jar that you have to do. So I guess the second question, which probably put everyone in the audience really wants to know, is how much better was it to work with me than Michael? The epitome of a loaded question. Um, what? You, you know, I would I would say, obviously, uh, you know, the jo the jokes were better. I will give you that. Um, <laughs> but you know, I think the freedom 
the freedom with Michael was unlimited. So, you know, oh, that's, okay. that, that's where, that's, you know, it, 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 it me of a, uh, going to dad and going to mom. <laughs> the first time I heard that once. Yeah. Brad does not like being called mom, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's get started. Um, and we mentioned dental support organizations earlier, just kind of, I guess, to start, uh, kind of introduce what is a DSO? Yeah, DSO, um, like you said, it's dental support organization. And I think it's it's a fluid term. I mean, even when I got into dental about 10 years ago, you know, there was called MSOs, you know, DPOs. And, but I think essentially it's, you know, a, an organization that is designed to help clinicians, you know, in this case, dentist, with everything that you can imagine that's not clinical. And that can be everything from accounting, legal, finance, IT, compliance, marketing, et cetera, you know, with a very simple the goal, which is if you could take that off their plate, they can focus more on clinical, deliver better patient care, in turn will result in, you know, better financial results as they're just focusing on what they're what they're good at. And so when you left us um, to abandon us, for me, just hang out with Michael, which is awful, by the way. Um, tell me when you're, you first stepped in uh, switching over to the, the, the light and working inside one of these DSOs, what was like some of the first things you started noticing right away? Yeah, I mean, I think it, if you can, you know, the first thing I noticed was just originally, I mean, the lack of, you know, complexity. I think it was, you know, call it, if you're comparing it to a baseball game, the first or second inning. Of uh, you know, we no one even you know we'd go to our annual, you know, conference, you know, which like called the ADSO. There was I think the first one I remember going to about forty people. <laughs> you know, wow. last year there's like twenty six hundred. You know, I mean, so just wow. there wasn't. I mean, you're kind of writing the playbook a little bit mm-hmm. in in a sense. I mean, you know, if you look at it from a financial point, I think you know, twenty thirteen there's about eight to ten private equity backed DSOs, and now I think the count is like one hundred and sixty. So I mean. That was probably the biggest thing is just that it was so early innings trying to get creative on what truly, you know, I would say our motto was listen to the, listen to our dentist. What services do they need? You know, what do they want? And then how do we build it kind of back office infrastructure from there? Was it an advantage or a disadvantage to have the legal training at the beginning in those early stages? You know, I mean, and I'm not just saying this because y'all are, you know, two of the my first two bosses, let alone <laughs> best bosses, but. I think it, no, it, it did help because, I mean, go back to, you know, you look in 2013, I mean, we were have, we were doing lobbying to the, on the state board level because at that point, DSOs were still frowned upon. Yes. You know, there was, everything was legal. I mean, compli- everything had a compliance element to it. If you, you know, if you look at the average practice back then, no one knew what compliance was. There was, no one had heard of Stark or anti-kickback or any. I mean, Again, it was just the wild, wild west and not intentional, but you have a dentist who's the CEO of every department of a small office. I mean, they just didn't have the knowledge nor the time nor the, you know, guys like y'all to who could kick off questions to. So it helped. But I mean, obviously it was it took a while to, you know, it's funny to see today where now it is so professional, you know, it's professionalized. There's everyone's kind of evolved. Yeah. Um, so let's, you know, we were talking about DSOs, but kind of, let's kind of dive a little bit deeper into for our audience members are just, you know, they're used to going to see a, their family dentist every day, but there's lots of different types of specialties out there. Tell us about um, the different specialties you see and work with uh, on the either from the DSO side or just in general. Yeah, I think for, you know, okay, you know, in, where I'm at MB2, I mean, our model is a little bit unique because we work with all specialties. I mean, I think there's, you know, it's called seven of them. There's your general practitioner, which is the neighborhood dentist. You have, you know, endodontist which is citing as root canals, you have <laughs> periodontist, prosthodontist, you know, pediatric, oral surgery, and, you know, and then uh, orthodontics. And so you have some DSOs that focus on, you know, just one, you know, there's orthodontic only DSOs. There's some that, you know, maybe one or two oral surgery and pediatrics for us. I mean, ours is a, it's a joint venture, but we have all, all of those specialties. Um, and so, you know, again, in that's been kind of the, I would say the last two to three years has been a change about, how do the specialties work together to give the, you know, the best patient care, was, you know, especially in COVID it, it made you, you know, how do we reduce patient visits? Mm-hmm. Someone having, you know, I mean, we all have kids, you're going to the orthodontist, to the, you know, then you're going to the general dentist office and like, we, you know, how do we shrink that to where it's easiest for the parents as well? Yeah, that's a good point. And you mentioned MB2. So maybe for our audience members, Michael, introduce just, 
a little bit of background on we, we have Justin on here, not because he's a friend, but because of your background. Tell him, give him some breath as to what does that, what does your business do so they can understand your background a little better. Yeah. So, uh, ME2, we're based, based here locally in, uh, Carrollton, Texas, but, um, we have, I guess, as of today, 475 practices across 38 states. So we have about 800 dentists and about 6,000 employees and, you know, all unique practices. So you know, we are in rural Alaska to, Manhattan, New York. I mean, it really does kind of span the spectrum. And our whole model is that every partnership and affiliated office we have, that doctor has ownership and runs their business. And, you know, our goal is to how do we change as little as possible and just provide value? And everyone's got different, you know, goals. Some people want you know, more and more in this market. It's HR help. How do we, you know, stay on top of that? I mean, ironically, the Compliance and legal is no one cared about that three years ago, and now it's we get a lot of questions on it. I think COVID, you know, sped that up. And you know, again, we just try to. And how do we? We always say our quick motto is like, how do we get them to their personal and professional financial goals quicker and faster with less risk with us than without us? And it's been it's been fast growth, but uh, I think today we're like the fourth or fifth largest group in the country. And so yeah, just trying to keep finding good doctors and provide value to them. It's fascinating, isn't it? You know, I think just with my background, I think of a DSO as an entity that's kind of providing efficiencies and integration on the business side. But you mentioned something about, you know, I don't know if it's clinical integration, but clinical efficiencies. Is that something y'all work on with uh, having all these uh, different practices yeah. join? Absolutely. I, I mean, I always say, I'm like, you know, we are not that smart. We just get to share wins and losses when you have 800 doctors and 475 practices. So, like, you know, even subspecialty, we have, you know, an orthodontic study group that, you know, on, via our app on, our, on their phones, they're sharing literally live case, case that question, what do you, what would you do here? What would you do here? What do y'all think about that? And that is literally, I would say, you know, dentistry, they always say, we always get the feedback of they're on an island by themselves. I'm sure y'all hear that every yes. medical profession. And so that is such an underrated piece of this that it's hard to measure. But, you know, I mean, again, we're sharing best clinical practices. You know, we do two to three continuing education events a month that are put on by our own doctor, right? We have like, you know, it's the best, you know, person in Invisalign, which we have, like they're teaching the other members of the group, which buys into the whole culture piece. And, you know, I think, you know, people, when they're aligned properly, they want to share their clinical best practices and, and things that don't work. I know that's what we see on just as much. That's fascinating. I, mean, I kind of want to sign up. Yeah, me too. <laughs> we have one obstacle. I mean, we're not dentists. We yeah. are doctors, though. Yes, doctors true. in law. Yeah, so I can help yeah. I, I I tell a lot of our dentists all the time, like I, you know, I'm, I'm a recovering lawyer, a juris doctorate, <laughs> but you know, I'm a below average one of that. But we'll work on it. <laughs> I beg to differ. I've yeah. seen you practice. <laughs> so let's let's move move over a little bit off that uh, and into just kind of some challenges that are facing the. DSO, you know, dental industry, den dental industry with the consolidation that you're seeing. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, you know, it, the consolidation, like I said, it's, it has sped up since COVID. I think, you know, you have the same problems kind of affecting, you know, most businesses you see, you know, HR, rising inflation, you know, people forget, you know, if you go to, you know, whatever, a local restaurant, they can raise their prices. They just change the menu. You know, we are in contracts with every, you know, provider, you know, Blue Cross, Aetna, Delta Dental. So we cannot raise pricing. And so for us, it's, you know, how do we, you know, how do we get better pricing on our products? How do we leverage, you know, I guess our own network to do more procedures in house that we don't do? And we have a payer management strategy team where it's with data scientists and all they're doing is analyzing rates and, you know, what is our, you know, should we drop a carrier and go out of network? Or, you know, what's the volume loss for that? And so that's been something I think that's, it's, it, it's a huge challenge right now. And, you know, like, you know, I think with, you know, you have so many of these guys entering the space and, you know, we always say we want to make sure for the industry that, there's, you know, everyone does it the right way. We integrate, you know, our, we always say the ability to integrate a practice into a DSO is probably the most overlooked part because we want to, you know, we want to win the staff over, you know, we're, we're partnering with great practices and, you know, but we don't want to screw that up. And so it's, it's gaining the trust and that's, you know, right now, I just think it's just, you know, turnover is rampant across every industry. And so, you know, our biggest, it's people business right now, like everything else, you know, and if we treat our people well, they provide good patient care. 
And you said something I wanted to ask you a little bit further on is, you know, you were talking about having people negotiate contracts and stuff. And from your market research that you guys are looking at, how different is it from a pay payer situation where you have a lot of situations where that community, everyone's in some dental plan, but other communities, it's cash based. So y'all see a big switch. Like, is it really state driven, or community driven? Yeah. I mean, I, and I had no idea about this, but it, it's completely, you know, community driven. I mean, I didn't realize there's, you know, I think we're part of 145 Blue Cross dental plan. You know, I thought it was just one, but mm-hmm. like, I always use the example, we have an office, you know, a couple offices in Amarillo, Texas. Well, that, you know, Delta Dental is the largest carrier by far because the three biggest employers in the city are Delta Dental. And so that, you know, that's very different than, you know, we have an office in Kenai, Alaska, which is basically 100% out of network outside. And there's, we accept one insurance, and that's the school district. Mm. You know, and so it, it really is, it, it, you have to look at every single office differently, which has a scalability aspect that's tough. Mm-hmm. But that's why we, you know, we, that, that department's growing because you re, it, it's not just one national contract. And do you see, though, just in general, is that um, is it 50 50 when it comes from cash and in, in, in contracts, or is it it's so it's so all over the place nationally, it's, you can't even figure out what those numbers look yeah, like? Yeah, I mean, I think they do a good job of not giving us great data to compare. It's, <laughs> it's like apples to oranges. And so, I mean, yeah, like you'll find a rural town that has, you know, a 35% better rate than, you know, a town 45 minutes away. Huh. makes no sense. Um, but, you know, that's that's the hard part of what, how we fight for the doctors and try to just use data to show that, you know, we, with our, you know, we have compliance team. We have all this, you know, we were able to show that the overall lifespan of care is, you know, for the insurance company, a better perspective with us so without us to be the service the whole, you know, the whole town essentially. Right. That makes sense. Well, from we, now that we're kind of, Walked a little bit further into the DSO. What, from a business perspective, what is the biggest business challenge that the DSO faces? Yeah, I think right now you're seeing. I mean, it's it's scalability. You know, I think it's you know we see and I'm, I know. I mean, I remember when working with y'all. I mean, a lot of times it's it, you know it's easy at one office and two and but ha- growing to size. I mean, you have to put up infrastructure. You have to spend money. You know, if anything, you probably take a couple steps back. And so. You know, we have we had you know we added 108 offices last year. Goodness. We had years where we did none because we were having to build out the revenue cycle team or build out the HR team or you know we grew if you, if you you know are, are if you're not careful you grow too fast but yes. it's constantly gauging that you know how do you how do you build enough infrastructure for the growth but you know still be fiscally responsible and not spend too much and you know it's we want to be around 10 years from now not just you know quick flips so I think scalability is right now the toughest just with all the competition that's that's out there and you mentioned earlier just the the people problem or people challenge there's not enough employees out there i would imagine that that really comes out when you're trying to scale yeah i mean you you if you have like you know we measure turnover in every department every office i mean if you're tur- turning over 15 20 percent of your workforce i mean that's you know, that's hard enough as it is, but when you're growing 20%, you know, it just compounds that problem. You have to, so that's, you know, we are, we try to be scrappy about, about it. And, you know, it's like, how do we widen the pool, you know, and increase the pool of candidates, but also, you know, you never want to sacrifice quality. It's, it's, it's tough. There's that, that, that's something that we have not cracked yet. And, and we're just having to right now throw kind of just throw manpower at it. And, you know, our HR team has doubled I think, since COVID and, you know, we're, <laughs> We're still hiring. So, wow. well, and when it comes to you said, you know, one year y'all y'all kind of hit the pause button. How harder was that on your investors and people who are, I guess, the people trying to go out and find practice for you to kind of rein them in for a year? Was that a, that a difficult thing, or was everyone kind of rowing with y'all? No, I, I think that you know, like I th- at that point we were just privately held by a bunch of dentists. So that I, I think that enabled us to do what's right for the business. I think, you I mean you're right. If you have a private equity investor, or family office. It, they're looking at one thing and that's like, you know, the rate of return. Right. And so if you're sitting out a year, it's, it's a tougher conversation, which we try to be very, very, very picky about who we partner with because of that reason. Right. I sure. think you, you know, again, I think most are smart enough to, you know, realize like, okay, you take a step back, but you're going to take two forward, whatever the old saying is. But no, I mean, that was, again, we had the luxury of, you know, we're still led by you know, my boss, our CEO and founder, the dentist that we're all our money was just a bunch of dentists. And so I think, you know, it's much easier. They understand. They were they were feeling it firsthand that we needed the infrastructure and press pause. That's good. Well, let's uh, 
kind of shift again, I would love to hear kind of the biggest healthcare compliance challenges you see kind of in the DSO world. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think this is, again, it, it's sped up. I mean, you know, I, I'm lucky enough, my brother-in-law is a private practitioner, he's an orthodontist. So, you know, he, I get both perspectives of a massive company to, to him. And, you know, it's, you know, compliance was a word that no one knew, right? But now it's like, you know, we have everything from, you know, we have payer audits, which never had 10 years ago. And not just, not just from government subsidy, you know, Medicaid, Medicare, but, you know, you have Blue Cross. I mean, we get an average about three to four a week that, you know, you're having to pull charts, provide narrative responses, go through, find old x-rays, you, know, you name it. I mean, and, you know, be very clear, an insurance company, you know, their job is to essentially, you know, pr- basically not pay you on, on certain claims and they want to ensure good, you know, quality of care is being done, which we, we of course respect, but, but it's a tough thing. You, you get that as a prior practitioner, you know, when do they have the time or the expertise to do that? And I think, you know, we're seeing, you know, dental board, I mean, we have, you know, that's just increasing, you know, most states, that's not an area that's been cut. And so you're seeing more and more dental board complaints and just more complexities with, you know, credentialing of, you know, getting, getting licensure properly, you know, the credentialing component with all these insurance carriers is used to take 20, 25 days. Now you're up to 90 days, mm-hmm. you know, because they're, they're understaffed. I think something that I never, you know, I always say is even as an attorney, probably took for granted sometimes is, is HIPAA. Huh. And so, you know, it's like, okay, everyone knows what it is, but you know, it's a real thing. You know, I'll give a real example of we had an office get broken into and people were, you know, they stole, you know, they were looking for like, money and scripts basically to write but they took a computer well we had you know this is five four or five years ago we had no idea we're like well no it was a massive you know because it contained just we had poor controls at that time and didn't have everything properly encrypted and it we you know it was a luckily we were we had cyber insurance we were called upon some great experts but you know it could have been up to a million dollar fine you know and it, it would have crippled one office dental group and so that's you know we have that's three we have three full-time people all they do is HIPAA, cyber work, and then, you know, OSHA. Do you sometimes walk by the office and laugh at them, point at them, keep walking? No, I try never to walk by them so they don't, <laughs> so they don't get on me for whatever I'm violating. But, you know, I mean, again, OSHA, COVID, I never even heard of the word OSHA and dental, you know, <laughs> that we had three or four, you know, OSHA reviews. Yeah, I think, you know, you have marketing examples of, can you do this? You know, it goes back to this, you know, can you say this in an advertisement? Can you have this referral relationship? You know, I think what y'all do day to day, but the structuring of transactions, you know, every state, you know, you have the sure. dental world, like North Carolina is tremendously more complex than, you know, you have than than Texas, for example. And I think that kind of the newest phase of we're seeing the legal side is kind of the craw the I guess the combination of dental and other medical specialties. You know, like Aspen Dental, which is the second largest group in the country, they are now they've now acquired a you know a veterinary platform, a med spa platform an urgent care platform Mm -hmm. under one umbrella. And so that I think is like the next 10 years of how to, you know, we incorporate kind of the whole patient into other, uh, other healthcare verticals. So that you can get your, your dog Botox. Is that what I'm I'm hearing? I I think you're, you're jumping to some conclusions, but I like where you're going. I like it. I I think that's an opportunity. (laughs) Veterinarian med spa and getting their their teeth cleaned. I like it. I mean, it's uh, I see big money here. Yeah, I have to. I'll observe too. I mean, even on our shows and talking to others and the things that we're talking about, we see this kind of idea of integrated healthcare mm-hmm. showing up where people are trying to figure out how people with different licenses can work together. Yeah. And I can imagine that that uh, would be a challenge in your world, but not one that I'd really thought about until you just said that. Especially dogs. Yes, hey, right. If you ever if you ever taken a dog to get their teeth cleaned, it's about four times what it costs for a human to yes. get their teeth cleaned. Yes, yeah. yes, it's complicated. It's, yeah, <laughs> but no, I do think that is kind of the future. It, it's integrated. It's how do we use patient data together? You know, like the whole like one health visit kind yes. of thing. And you know, I mean, you know, if you look at oral health and how it affects you know comorbidity, like you know, pre-existing conditions. I mean, it, there's a lot of data out there that you know I think will just you know, it will get there at some point. Yeah. Mm. It's awesome. Believe it or not, Justin, we're already have reached our time that flew by. Um, so what we'll do next is uh, we'll say bye and go into a commercial. And then, uh, Brad, we're going to have to come up with something legal to say on the other end Maybe. or just make fun of each other. Yes. Uh, either way. But anyway, 
Justin. Thank you. It was you. awesome having you. Thank you for no, joining. Thank you all for having me. Many business owners use legal counsel as a last resort rather than as a proactive tool that can further their success. Why? For most, it's the fear of unknown legal costs. Bird Adato's Access Plus program makes it possible for you to get the ongoing legal assistance you need for one predictable monthly fee. That gives you unlimited phone and email access to the legal team so you can receive feedback on legal concerns as they arise. Access Plus, a smarter, simpler way to access legal services. Find out more. Visit birdadato.com today. Welcome back to Legal 123's The Bird. I'm your host, Brad Adato. I'm still here with my co-host, Michael Bird. And Michael, this season, our theme is especially Spotlight. We just had our longtime friend and colleague, Justin Puckett, join us. And was there's so many great things that he said, especially the fact that he liked me better than you. But the focus that he brings into this uh, market there's um, from the DSO, the Dental Support Organization, it was great hearing his thoughts. I mean, this is a guy who's been in it ever since the beginning of time. He even said... How it was early, he was one of the first people in that area, and it was really the, the growth side of it. But for our audience members that want to understand better is why they need to have um, a DSO, he, he laid out a lot of different pieces as reasons for that, really being their back office, similar to an MSO. But maybe you can help shine a light on um, other aspects of it, which um, as to what, what are reasons for having DSOs? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it we don't even talk about it anymore, but the fundamental why of having a DSO is because you have non-dentists wanting to be a part of a business that is practicing dentistry. Right. And, and the laws are very similar in, in many ways to medicine in the sense that many states have a corporate practice of dentistry law. The states vary and they regulate who can own a business that's practicing dentistry or and sometimes they even go further than that. Who can operate a business that's practicing dentistry? Mm -hmm. And so the DSO market came about because of this that very fact that you're trying to navigate the corporate practice of dentistry. And you know, you and I talk about this often is that the dentistry kind of industry is a great kind of preview for the medical industry yeah. because they're about 10 years ahead of medical and you heard justin talk about the the low number of members in the dso you know trade association well there's not really even mso trade associations yet um and so the uh, it, it, even as an example in texas there's now legislation regulating dso's which mm -hmm. is uh, maybe something we'll see in the future on the on the medical side and uh, and then of course the corporate uh, you know private equity roll up stuff that that Justin talked about that is a huge player in DSOs is is again a good preview for what we're starting to see in the uh, medical side of things. Yeah, especially hearing him talk about a lot of these dentists are on their own little island. That's uh, you know audience members know when we talk a lot about these you know small practices in the medical side. It's the same concept is. You're out there by yourself, so you're, you can just go join a local hospital because you can't figure out how to do it by yourself anymore. Or you join a giant mega group. Well, that's the same concept of this DSO bringing it along, saying, well, you can still basically run your practice in the sense that you get to you get to be a great dentist. But what let us help you with all the other compliance aspects? And as as Justin was saying, it gets it gets more and more complicated. You actually have to learn more about that, and that's what's a great aspect of being a part of a program like that is. Yeah, and I would just say too that it's it, we can make these analogies to make everyone kind of see the patterns of similarities. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's really important to understand that there are nuances. Like the corporate practice of dentistry is different yep. than the corporate practice of medicine. So sure when we're doing dental deals, you know, again, we're focusing on the state. Yeah. What state are they in? What? How do you navigate that when you're setting up your DSO or if you're doing a, a an M and A deal in dental? There are nuances that are different, and there are some things like HIPAA that have a lot a lot of similarities, uh, regardless of what type of you know license you're dealing with. But um, you know, I, I, it's easy to draw these analogies to kind of you know show the similarities of these different licenses out there but uh, don't want to lose sight of the fact that they're they are 
regulated differently and there are nuances. Yeah. And it's, it's like a lot of things is that just because it seems like it's the same, it's not. So just because we don't charge our guests any money um, doesn't mean that we're, we're not as good as those other podcasts. True. Yes. Um, although I think we should start charging. Yeah, them. I agree too. Or I'll start charging you. Yeah. Oh, that's even, wait, I don't like that idea. Right. Oh. scratch that. Don't let that be in there. Michael, that is unfortunately the end of season nine on Specially Spotlight. Do not panic, Michael. Sit down. Sit down. Don't run. Okay. Season 10 is just around the, the corner. So listeners out there, guess what? On October 5th, 2022, you get to learn all about what we're releasing next. Bertadato is providing this podcast as a public service. This podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute legal advice, nor does it establish an attorney-client relationship. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by Bertadato. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Please consult with an attorney on your legal issues.